A couple Wednesday nights ago, I said something to the effect of, if you've been living in a cave, you may not be aware of some of the news that's going on in this world. But about a month ago now, 239 people disappeared in an airplane. The Malaysian airplane, MH370, that we've heard so much about. And uh, I will be honest with you, I, I kind of like to watch the news a little bit about it and see if they've they found anything new about it. But one thing that I notice that's very difficult, and if you've tried to place yourself in the shoes of the family members of those people on that airplane, they have been on a roller coaster ride up and down, up and down. News of the airplane has been found, and all of a sudden it's just, it's just a bunch of trash in the ocean that we thought was the airplane. And now, now supposedly we hear uh, little sounds that are coming from the black box that have, was in the airplane, and nobody knows where it is. Nobody knows what has happened to those people and to that airplane. And one thing that I've heard on a few occasions is those people, the family members, and I think that we can understand this, that until they find an airplane, uh, some piece or some evidence that this airplane has indeed crashed in, in the water or somewhere, or until they see the, the member of their family's body that now has been deceased and separated from the spirit, until one of those two things happen, I can understand why some of them still have a sliver of hope that their loved one is somehow alive somewhere in this world. And no doubt one of them has used the old adage that we'll see from the Bible that they are hoping against what? They're hoping against hope that their loved one somewhere is still alive. Now that's a good way to introduce our topic today of hope. We talked about a couple weeks ago that we're going to come down the pike and talk about what the Bible has to say about the concept and subject of hope. And there's a lot to say. Many of our songs and our song books are about the concept of hope. We sing about whispering hope. We talk about an anchor that is both sure and steadfast. We hope that it will keep us grounded in this world that we live in. I want to mention just a few things briefly this morning with you about the subject of hope. First off, if you're taking notes, hope allows us to believe in the seemingly impossible. Hope allows us to believe in the seemingly impossible. In the Bible, where our Bibles are turned to, Romans 4, and verse 18 through 22, this, by the way, just by way of introduction, are verses talking about Abraham and Sarah. It says in verse 18, Who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. 19, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not to the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Think about the set of circumstances for Abraham and Sarah. How old was he? He was 100 years old. How old was Sarah? She was 90 years old. And we also understand the facet of the story that her womb was barren. It was dead. It was unable to bear children for 90 years. But Abraham was told that through Sarah, a child is going to come that's going to be the child of promise. And even though the set of circumstances was bleak and dark and dank, they hoped against what? They hoped against hope that God was going to deliver on the promise that he made. Now there are some things in our life that sometimes we may think, you know what, I, I just can't do it. It's, it's impossible and I, I have no hope to do this anymore. Like when we read verses 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, the Bible says that it's possible for you and I to overcome temptation. There are some times where people have faced a, a certain temptation for so long and, that, and they've given in and given in that now they feel like it's impossible to overcome temptation, but it's not. There is always hope to overcome temptation with God's help. 
In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, we learn that God is willing to forgive all unrighteousness and to forgive us of our sins. There have been times where somebody has mentioned to me, maybe you too, if you just knew the things that I have done, if you just knew some of the things that I have said or thought in my mind, you would know then that God would not forgive me. You ever been told that before? Thought that before? That God, God's not going to forgive me? It's an impossibility that God would forgive me? Well, there's hope. There's always hope that God will forgive you and me if we have the right kind of heart. You remember in Matthew 21 and verse 21 where the Bible, Jesus is talking about that if you have enough faith, if you have enough faith, you can do what with mountains? That you can move mountains. Now we know certainly that you and I are not going to go down to the great smoky mountains and say, I have enough faith, I want this mountain to be moved. That's not what Jesus was talking about, was he? He was talking about the amount of faith and hope that we have to overcome what seems like monumental problems in our life. Now, everybody has problems. They're big and large, and some of them are, are medium-sized, but those big, giant problems, whatever form they take, sometimes it seems like it's just impossible we're going to be able to overcome those. And with God's help, and with our trust in Him and in His Word, and a hope that we can latch on to, there is always that hope to overcome those big problems that come into our life. Let's go to the book of Romans 8 as we think about something else, though, about hope. We think about those big, giant, monumental problems that are in our life. That leads us into something else we want to think about hope, and that is the hope saves us. The hope saves us. If you and I were to sit down today and start making a list of everything that saves us, biblically speaking, what's well, a long, it's actually a, a pretty lengthy list. 14 or 15 things where the Bible says plays a role in our salvation. If you were to start making a list of all of those things, I know that you would talk about faith and you would talk about baptism and, and you would talk about some other things. What seemingly is left out sometimes is hope. The Bible very clearly says in Romans 8, verses 24 and 25, For we are saved by what? We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man sees, why does he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Now you might be wondering, what is it that you and I have never seen, but we hope to see one day? Well, that's pretty clear, the answer to that, isn't it? I have never seen God. You have never seen God. Nobody has seen God face to face. Some people have gotten pretty close, but nobody has seen God face to face. But we hope to one day, do we not? I have never seen personally, physically, and bodily form Jesus Christ, and no man uh, of us have, have seen that. I hope to one day. There have been a few thousand, maybe a million people who were on the earth at the time that Jesus lived and they were able to, to view Him and see Him. We have not. But we hope to one day, one day, do we not? The same with the Holy Spirit. The same with the home in heaven. Never seen heaven. We dream of it. We sing about it. We read about it. And we hope to go there one day. Hope is an expectation that one day we hope to realize. How is it that hope saves us? Well, as you turn your Bibles over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's really a simple equation. When life gets difficult and rough, and it does sometimes, doesn't it? And some of those monumental problems begin to stack up in our life, and our friends seem to disappoint us. Sometimes even our family leaves us in, in, in their wake, and we're all, it seems like, by ourselves. One building block of the Christian faith Christian's faith is the hope to go on to a world that is absent of those problems. We look forward to the day that's described in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 16 through 18 where the Lord himself is going to descend with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds, and therefore we will be with him forever. 
and that we're to comfort one another with these words. We, look, we should be looking forward to that day. I look forward to, according to Matthew 25, verses 21 and 23. You remember the, the parable of the talents? One had five, one had two, one had one. Five and two both doubled their talents, did they not? And to them Jesus says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I hope to hear those words one day. And then to hope to hear those words one day is what keeps one working towards that goal. Again, you think back to the introduction and, and all the tragedy that has surrounded what in the world is going on with that airplane. There are all kinds of airplanes and ships and people who are looking for some type of evidence as to what occurred. And they will continue, I suppose, to do that until we figure it out. And that's the same thing that's going to happen with you and I. Until I see God, and you see Jesus, and we all see the Holy Spirit, and we all get to heaven, it's only going to remain a hope for us. It hasn't been realized yet. And in that way, that's how the Bible explains hope saves us. It's what uh, buoys us when life gets difficult. Let's move on, though, to the book of Ephesians in chapter 2. There's a further point I want to illustrate that the Bible illustrates about hope. And this is a sad but true point to make about hope. And that is the hope is not for everybody. The hope to see God and Christ and the Holy Spirit and the hope to be in heaven for eternity is not for everybody. One of the saddest, if not the saddest, verses in all of the Bible is in Ephesians 2 and verse 12. Look at all the sadness that's in this verse. Now, this verse, by the way, is with reference to Gentiles when they did not have a covenant with God under the old law. We know the Jews only have that. But I want you to think about this verse in terms of people today who have not been obedient to God. Consider what they are. That in the times past you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no what? Having no hope and without God in the world. What is a horrible, horrible place to be? To be in this world without God, to be an alien from the commonwealth of God's family, having no hope. Well, that's a bad place to be, isn't it? A bad place to be in this world. In fact, in the book of 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13, the whole reason that Paul talked to them about the Lord descending with a shout and the voice of the ark, the reason that Paul talked to them about that subject was apparently somebody came through Thessalonica and taught them poorly and falsely about those who died in Christ. And so Paul said, you know, I need to write to them about this subject. And he says in 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13, I don't want you to sorrow for those who have passed slept or sleeping in Christ as those who have no what? Those who have no hope. Yes, there are those who are living who have no hope right now. And there are those who have died and passed away and do not have any hope to go to heaven. That's a bad, sad place to be. Hope is not for everybody. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, we see that the few are contrasted with the many. Many are those that go into the wide gate that leads to destruction, and few there be that find the narrow gate that leads to life. You know, there's a religion on this earth right now that generally is called universalism. You know what universalism teaches? That all men, no matter when you live or where you live, all men are going to go to heaven. Now, I'm not sure what Bible the universalists read, but it's not the same one that I look at. The one that I look at tells me in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19, that if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most what? Most miserable. What a miserable life it is to live on this earth that God has given to us, and yet, not have the hope to go beyond. What a miserable life that is. It may be the life that you're living now because you have not obeyed God's law. 
And you go through your day and you work and you go to the post office and you eat and you do all these other things, but you still have no hope to go beyond, to be with God in heaven. That could change. We'll talk about that here in a few moments. That can change as long as your heart is still beating. In Colossians 1, chapter 1 and verse 23, when uh, Paul is talking about how the gospel has been preached to every creature, he says you need to continue in a faith grounded and settled and do not be moved away from what? Do not be moved away from the hope of the gospel. Now, oftentimes we talk about necessary inference. There are some things that you can infer from the way the Bible is worded. When the Bible there says, do not be moved away from the hope, clearly we're talking about Christians, aren't we? Those who have obeyed God, but are, are in danger of moving away from the hope that they once had. And so even though you might be a Christian, or I am a Christian, or you are a Christian, it is a possibility that I live in such a way that the hope that I once had is no longer mine to grasp. And that's a sad place to be as well. In Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6, you have that listing of those seven ones. Among those seven ones is one hope. Now, I think most of us are aware of this, that the Bible teaches this. But do we really stop and think about what this means? There's only one hope. There's only one way for me to achieve salvation from my sins. There's only one way, one road that I can travel that will lead to heaven. Not many. Jesus says, I am the what? I am the door. And if you want to enter in, you're going to have to go through who? You're going to have to go through me. There's only one door. When I was living, we were living in West Virginia, the church building, uh, we found out one morning some, some teenager had come and stuck a bunch of gum into the keyhole. I mean, just kept pushing it and pushing it. He couldn't get the key in. We had, to call the, we had to call the lock master to come and to take the whole lock off and replace it before anybody could get in the building. And I vividly remember this fellow, this key, this key master, whatever you want to call it, lock, locksmith was standing there working on it. He had, he had no idea what the Bible says. He has no idea what the Bible knows as far as I know. He's not a child of God. He doesn't seem to be somebody, at least to me, who regularly visited any kind of church building. But he said there's only one way into this church. And you know what? He's exactly right. He may have not known what he was saying, but he's exactly right. There's only one way to become a member of the Lord's body. And there's only one avenue that I can travel to ensure that I get to heaven. And that's to have this one hope. That's to have this one hope that we're talking about today. There's a couple other things you might consider as we, we move along. In the book of Hebrews chapter 6. Another thing that we might glean from the Bible as far as what it says about the concept of hope is that hope, according to Hebrews 6 and verse 19, is an anchor of the soul. Hope is an anchor of the soul. Look at verse 18 of Hebrews 6, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope Set before us which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil. Now we know that this hope here is being described as Christ. He is our hope. And without Him we would have no hope. But don't you like the way the writer here, whoever it is, describes what hope is, the imagery that it brings up, that it's an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. That helps describe what hope does for us in this life. If you, if you were to go and read the book of Acts, 
chapter 27 and verses 20 and verse 29. Acts 27 verses 20 and verse 29. We know we're getting near the end. Paul is on his way to Rome to be a prisoner. And he says in verse 20, or Luke writes, And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope was what? All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. We might paraphrase that by saying that all hope was what? All hope was lost. They lost all of their hope that they would even survive the storm that they were in. Nevertheless, you look down at verse 29, then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, what did they do? They cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Now that's a physical example of what you and I figuratively do. Don't you have some dark days? Don't we all have dark days where it seems like the light has not shined upon us figuratively? It may be due to health reasons or, or financial reasons or family matters or friendly concerns that we have. It may have something to do with our employment. But the fact of the matter is we all have dark days. And sometimes they're so dark that we're like Paul and his companions that we lose all what? We lose all hope. And that's when we have to do what? The same thing that these mariners did is to cast out anchors. Those anchors being hope and faith and trust in God that we can make it through this difficult time. And again, I say, I don't know how somebody who is not a child of God makes it through this life not having this hope they can use as an anchor. I don't know how they do it. Do you? And further up on that, I don't know how a child of God who once knew this hope and had this hope just, just makes shipwreck of it, as you read about in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 19. They just make shipwreck of their life. I don't know how they get through life knowing that they had this hope, they once grasped this hope, and now they just, th they just threw it away. It's a tough life that I can think about trying to live. You remember over in Romans chapter 5, in verses 3 and 4, I want you to, if you turn over there or listen to me read this, I want you to think, if you were writing Romans 5, verses 3 and verse 4, if you were the author of these verses, would you write it the same way that Paul wrote it? He says in verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in. We glory in. Now, if you were the author... The writer, what would you put in that blank? I take glory in blank. Well, a lot of us would put my family or my friends or my job or any other number of things. What did Paul write? He says, we glory in tribulations. Paul, what's wrong with you? You remember somebody once said that to Paul, I think you're mad. I think you're crazy. Something's wrong with you. And it seems like you hear when he says, oh, we just glory in tribulations. What's wrong with you, Paul? Paul, read the rest of it. Why? Why do you glory in tribulations? Well, he says, because I know that tribulation works patience. It brings about patience. And that patience brings about experience. And when that experience is full grown, he says that brings what? That brings hope. Our hope should be getting stronger and more vibrant the more difficult our days are. We don't want difficult days. I don't wake up, neither do you, and say, boy, I hope this is the hardest day I've ever lived. But sometimes those days come along, and when we get through those tribulations, we become more patient. And the next time that tribulation comes, we, we can endure it just a little bit easier. And the more experience we have in going through those difficult days and using that hope as an anchor, our hope grows stronger. Our hope grows stronger. It becomes that anchor that the writer of Hebrews spoke about. Now one final thing that I want to point out about hope in the book of Colossians chapter 1, and then our lesson will be complete this morning. Colossians chapter 1. Where is your hope laid at? 
Where's, where is it laid at? Well, according to the pen of Paul in Colossians 1 and verse 5, he says, For the hope which is laid up for you, what's those next two words? For the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. In heaven, where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? The final thing, the final concept about hope today is that hope is laid up in heaven. My hope is not tied to anything or any person on this earth, whether it's somebody who is living or who has lived on this earth. My hope is not tied or tethered to any possession or anything on this earth. And neither should you be. Now you know what's the next thing to say. Is that it's e- that's easier said than done. We believe that. We teach that. We say that. We preach that. That our hope should not be tethered to anything or anybody on this earth. But you certainly know, so as do I. That's easier said than done. Because what you and I know from what we can see and what we can ascertain and tangibly touch, everything that you and I know of anything has to do with this world, doesn't it? And so that makes it a difficult concept to understand and to live that our hope actually is not on this earth. It's actually in heaven. That's what Jesus had in mind in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, when he was in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Why, Jesus? Well, on earth, moss, uh, moth and rust corrupts those things, and, and thieves break through and steal those things. And so his, his advice and his command is to lay up for yourselves treasures where at? In heaven. That's where your treasure ought to be. And he says in verse, 20, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You ever read of anybody? I think uh, uh, I've read of a, a country music superstar. I think uh, maybe Melissa's family may have something to do with him re- relation-wise. But uh, he had a, had a distrust of banks. He didn't trust the banks. And so he, he kept all of his money in his house and or in, on, in his mattress or under his mattress or something. But there's been a lot of people who have done that. And lo and behold, what happens? The house burns down. Then what's going to happen? Where's all that money then? Well, that's gone. And that fella or that lady, whoever it might be, should have learned the lesson that even though there may be some bad things that banks do, the better and more safe place would be is somewhere away from you. And when I put my faith and hope and trust in, in things on this earth, I read in 2 Peter 3 that this earth and the works therein shall be what? Shall be burned up in fervent heat. And then where's my hope? If it's tied to things on this earth. Where is it? Well, it's been burned up. It's gone, isn't it? The Bible in the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 in verse 4, my, my hope, as you turn your Bibles over to 1 Peter 1, my hope and your hope should be that I'm looking forward to an inheritance that's given by God that's laid up in heaven. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, Peter describes this inheritance that you and I are looking forward to. This makes a good, this make a great lesson. It's already outlined for you. He says in verse 4, to an inheritance... Look at all the way that this inheritance is described. It is incorruptible. Everything that you and I see, taste, touch, and feel on this earth is corruptible. It will not last forever, including our bodies. Our inheritance is undefiled. It is pure. It says an inheritance that fades not away. Everything that you and I know fades away. Our bodies fade away, if you will. Our hair starts to turn gray. Our eyes start to dim. Our grinders, as Solomon talks about in Ecclesiastes 12, they cease in their few, our teeth. Our hands start to tremble, and we start to bow over. What I used to not be scared of, I'm deathly scared of now. And all those little tiny things I used to do without ever thinking about it, I don't do now because I'm afraid if I bend over to pick up that coin, I may not get back up. 
We fade, our bodies fade away. Our clothes fade. Our buildings fade. These buildings that are built 40, 50 years ago are not meant to last forever. The pews don't, they don't last forever. They fade away. Our cars fade away. They rust away. Our houses, they fade away. Everything in this world that we, you and I can see fades away. But our inheritance that God has promised to us will not fade away. But look at that last describing phrase of our inheritance. Not only is it incorruptible, not only is it undefiled, not only will it not fade away, but guess what? It's reserved in heaven for you. It's not here. That's why the first three things can be said about that because that's where it is. It's reserved in heaven for you. Now, is Peter talking to you, by the way? Is he talking to me about an inheritance that's reserved for you and you and you and me? Or can that not be said yet? Because we have not obeyed God's law that he wants us to to live by. Finally, Philippians 3 and verse 20. The old King James says that our conversation, our conversation is in heaven. But many of your versions that you're using and reading today, and you can see it for yourself, does not use the word conversation. It actually uses the word citizenship. Our citizenship is nowhere else or should be nowhere else except where? In heaven. Technically speaking, I am not. I am not an American. My citizenship, technically speaking, is not here. My citizenship is where I is in heaven. Now, I was born here, and I am an American by, by the fact that I was born here, and, I, and most of us can say that, and some of us have I've become Americans in different ways, and that's great. But our citizenship actually is where I is in heaven. I'm a citizen of God's kingdom. No matter where I go on this earth, no matter where I am born or where somebody else may be born, if they're a child of God, they are a citizen of heaven. And because they are, they must follow the citizenship rules of heaven. Just like we have talked about before as we wrap things up, when people, people by the boatloads and by the scores and multitudes are streaming over the borders into this country, you know, to hear some of the doom and gloom that comes out of our nation's capital and our, and our capitals of our states, to hear all the doom and gloom, you would think it would be just the opposite, wouldn't you? That the people would be streaming out of this country. But that's not true. There are people who would get on tiny little rickety crafts off the coast of Cuba and, go for, and try to go across a strait that's 90 miles long, full of storms, full of waves, full of, full of swells of water that can easily knock over their rickety crafts, but they want to get to this country. And the law for them is, once they get a foot on this country, they can stay. That's what they're trying to do. That ought to be the way that we try and want to become a member of the citizen of heaven, a citizen of God's kingdom. To do whatever it takes to be one and to stay one. And as we're set to sing the song, I believe, 276. Some of you know this because you went through it. You were not born in this country, but you wanted to become a member of it. And so there were certain requirements that you had to meet in order to become a a citizen of the United States of America. And if you want to go and read these for yourself to verify, you can. In order to become a citizen of the United States of America, there are certain things you have to do and know. You have to have the right language. Still, even though it may not seem like it, you still have to know the right language. You have to know how to talk. Same is true with God's kingdom. There are certain ways I should and should not be talking. To become a citizen of this America, I must have a high moral character, a high moral fiber. Hard to believe, isn't it? But the same is true of God's kingdom. In order to be a member of God's kingdom, a citizen of God's kingdom, I must have a high moral character. 
in order to become a member of the United States of America, I must decry or denounce any allegiance to any country from which I came and promise all of my allegiance to who? To this country. And that I will do if I'm asked all that I can to destroy all enemies, whether they're foreign or what? Domestic. Same is true for God's kingdom, isn't it? That when I become a member, a citizen of heaven, I denounce my allegiance, I repent. I change my mind of my allegiance to all the sins and wrong things that I have been doing, and I promise my allegiance to God. That's what I do when I confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I promise my allegiance to God, and I also promise that when any enemy comes in, whether it's from outside the Lord's body or inside the Lord's body, I will do all that I can to eradicate that for my protection and for the protection of others. If you are not a citizen of God's kingdom, you are without hope, my friend. And without hope, you are one of the most miserable, not because of who you are, but because of where your standing is. Miserable people in this world. And that can all change quickly this morning. I know that you've heard and I know that you believe you probably wouldn't be here. Now it's time for you to to make that change. To make that change from those things that are wrong to repent of sin and, and to march in the other direction to confess and to profess that Jesus is the Son of God, to to profess your allegiance to God and to become buried with Christ in baptism and rise to walk in newness of life. And like the eunuch, not only will you go away rejoicing, we all will. We all will. Just like all those people who are in a room somewhere in this country who have went through all the requirements to become a citizen of this country, that once they take that oath, and make that promise, they are told that they are now citizens of this country, the United States of America. They are all so elated. Same is true for when you become a citizen of God's kingdom. Make sure that you have the hope that we've talked about today as we stand and as we sing.